Uh, so what I have here is asterisk running up in a uh, cloud right now. And it is working. I called actually a Phoenix number I registered last night, and my Google Fi phone is ringing. So all I've set up here really is um, asterisk is registered to this DID I have purchased. So I call the Phoenix number into the asterisk box. I have a super simple dial plan there that's just relaying the number out to my Google Fi phone. Uh, so what I can do here is hop into, this is an OpenStack Horizon environment. This is the GUI through which we drive OpenStack or one of the ways. I'm gonna hop in here and there's my little asterisk server. I'm gonna do my drop down menu here and tell it to go away. So I'm gonna shut off that instance. And yep, shut off instance. And of course now, I, that um, VM's not running. So if I were to call the number again, it's, it's not gonna work, right? I don't have an asterisk server there. So we'll get back into that and play with that some more. I just wanted to show you that it is indeed working. Um, the point of my talk here, just married asterisk, or OpenStack and asterisk, um, just out of curiosity, by show of hands, how many people run asterisk currently on, in a virtual environment, virtualized environments? So like half of us, what about bare metal environments? You run it straight on bare metal. Okay, a couple of us. Um, right now, there is a huge push um, to run lots and lots of stuff virtually, right? Everything's moving to the cloud. So I thought it might be kind of entertaining or might be an interesting talk if I taught you a little bit about cloud, specifically cloud as built by OpenStack. So in a moment, in sort of under 45 minutes, I'm gonna to try to cover a lot of material here. I'll give you an introduction of who I am and what we're gonna cover. Uh, we're gonna crash course our way through OpenStack. So what is OpenStack? as much as what isn't OpenStack. Who's using OpenStack, so what companies um, are, are thinking that this is a hot idea. We want to define the role of hypervisors and VMs, so let's really get a clear picture of what a cloud is. And then we'll take a peek into OpenStack's back end. We can actually see sort of how OpenStack works. Uh, furthermore, this is Astracon, so I guess I should wiggle asterisk into here. We'll see where asterisk fits into this picture. And from a customer perspective, so some of you raised your hand and said, oh, we run asterisk on bare metal. Um, what would it mean if you pushed your bare metal asterisk environment into a cloud? What are the repercussions of that? What do you have to know before you, you go at that? Uh, my name is Russell Zachary Fieser. My webpage, rzfieser.com, you can check out. I have some giveaways there, uh, my latest blog post. Uh, I'm an instructor for a company called Alta3 Research and Iris7. Um, in addition to instruction, I do lots of research and course development. Uh, big gamer as well, and sort of my free time. Uh, as far as stuff we do, uh, Alta3 Research, we do IT, telecom, cloud training. Um, On-site, online, public and private events. I actually cut my teeth on learning SIP protocol, so RFC 3261 I learned really well five or six years ago. The training on that kind of dried up a little bit. The market's very saturated at this point. A lot of people understand SIP. So I had to switch gears, and I said, well, okay, what else uses SIP? And it turns out this thing called the IP multimedia subsystem, which is the core network that every cell phone here is going through an IMS right now when you make a call. Um, I figured out, well, SIP's the glue that holds the IMS together. So I switched gears and started teaching IMS, and then add in LTE, LTE is just a very popular 4G access to get to the IMS core. That's easy to tack on. Um, because I was good at SIP, I started doing Avaya and SIP trunking stuff, lots of heavy Wireshark actually uh, uh, getting into the nuts and bolts of Avaya systems. Um, SIP, though, uh, business is you know, trickling in, so I said, oh, okay, let me start learning about OpenStack, because everybody's taking an IMS, and they're sticking it in an OpenStack cloud. So there I can just sort of learn that skill set. Um, it's crazy how many people are clamoring for OpenStack training right now. All the, I'll talk about it a little bit, but the current vendors, uh, VMware largely, is getting massively displaced by OpenStack. Uh, SDN, Network Function Virtualization, SDI, they're all stuff that I teach or Alta3 does. 
Um, if you're interested, feel free to give them a shout. So to start off, I thought I'd put forth sort of where OpenStack's coming from, what's driving it. Uh, the OpenStack Foundation started back in 2010, and Rackspace and NASA sort of threw over the fence um, some, some open source code and said, here, we'll call this OpenStack. Uh, Rackspace hosting, the software they threw over got branded Swift, which does object storage. In fact, I think there's some talks coming up today about Swift object storage. Um, NASA threw over this thing that was originally called uh, new, uh, sorry, uh, Nova, um, or Nebula, excuse me. They rebranded it Nova. Nova is really the heart and soul of OpenStack. It what controls our hypervisors, our compute nodes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, OpenStack Foundation starts in 2014, and it's basically like an astrocon. Uh, every six months they meet, they try to uh, produce some sort of cohesion within the community. Uh, they're really a gun ho on releasing new uh, products. So every six months, a new full release of this OpenStack product comes out. So if we go back to 2010, Austin, you'll see we just had Nova and Swift at that time. Um, Glance comes in, Glance's image storage. Uh, Keystone, Keystone. You know, holds the arch together, it's what, it's identity. So credentials, permissions, roles, all that sort of thing it handles. Horizon is the front end. All these names are fairly playful, right? You can see across the horizon. So if we have a front end GUI, it's called Horizon. It lets us see everything. Neutron is introduced, that performs our networking function. Uh, Cinder, Cinder blocks. Cinder gives us block storage. It creates volumes for us. Um, heat. Heat makes clouds rise, so Heat is an automation tool just for OpenStack. So if you've ever worked with like Ansible or Puppet or Chef or Salt or anything like that, um, Heat is custom made by OpenStack to be able to talk to these modules. Uh, so it can just automate the creation of VMs. Uh, telemetry, salometer, you'd find a salometer at an airport. We shine a salometer, it's a laser beam. We shine it up at a cloud ceiling detect, um, monitor clouds, basically. So, Solometer in OpenStack monitors our resources, monitors our VMs, how these different services are running. Trove is a database service, Sahara, ironic, I'm not really gonna talk about those. Um, I'm currently running a Mataka build, and it's incredible how polished this product is getting. Um, VMware, there's a reason a lot of people are swapping out VMware for this OpenStack thing. Um, I think this is a pretty interesting click. This website called Stacklytics shows us who is using this product. So it is open source. The product's maintained with Git and GitHub. Um, so they have really accurate numbers about who, I can make that a little bigger. bigger. They have accurate numbers of who is participating. Uh, so if I do like a contribution by company, and show all. You can see companies like Red Hat, Rackspace, IBM, Intel, Huawei, uh, Fujitsu, VMware, uh, IBM, AT&T, Walmart. Uh, there's this mass of Yahoo. Uh, basically, the Fortune 5000 companies are beginning to embrace OpenStack, largely because we don't have to pay licensing fees um, to companies like, well, to vendors anymore. I don't have to pick on VMware. So I want to get into, real quick, setting up this data center. We can pretend we just took the saran wrap off of this thing, and we're going to bootstrap it. Um, we looked at Horizon before. I showed you a little asterisk running up in a cloud. So my goal is to try to teach you guys where asterisk would live in this fictitious data center um, and how we'd be able to communicate with it. Uh, so the first thing is a top of rack switch. This would be a leaf or access switch. Uh, we want 10 gig links coming out of this to connect up our different nodes here. And then 40 gig uplinks up to a data center fabric um, up above that switch. Uh, we also want to create at least these nodes. Now, nodes might be a new word for some people. Um, for the purposes of this talk, given that you know, I have like a half hour left, 
Um, let's just say nodes is a physical concept. So whenever you see the word node, you go, okay, that's, we're, we're bootstrapping something physical. Um, understand that with OpenStack, with virtualization, we can do virtualization within virtualization within virtualization. It's like that movie Inception, if you've ever seen that, where you go into the different dream states. Um, so a node could actually be virtualized within a dream state. I'm not talking about that here. I'm talking about, let's put this stuff on bare metal. I think it's easier for us to conceptualize that stuff if we're new to it. Uh, the first node we're going to create is a cloud controller, which we call a lot of times just the controller node. Uh, that's going to be where all this software, most of this software gets installed I just told you about here. So any of those that, that support OpenStack um, are going to go there. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's like install Ubuntu 16.06, install these software packages. Uh, network node or network controller gets created next. Uh, that's, again, going to be install Ubuntu 16.06, install a, a software package called Neutron. So it's a controller of sorts, but it only controls networks. Any virtual network infrastructure we're going to create, virtual routers, virtual subnets, networks, whatever it might be, um, Neutron will play a role in that. We then have our compute. So right off the bat, when people say, hey, let's you know, go to the cloud, what they're really saying is let's go to compute. The size of your cloud is dictated by how many compute nodes you have. So on a compute node is where a hypervisor runs. And it's just going to be a one-to-one -one relationship. And I'll tell you right now, the most popular hypervisor to run in production environments is going to be either KVM or QEMU. Uh, KVM does really awesome uh, bare metal virtualization. So you get like bare metal speeds with KVM. QEMU does awesome emulation. So if you need to emulate, say, an ARM processor on top of an x86, QEMU is what you reach for. Um, either way, that's where your virtual machines are going to run is out on compute. Um, that name VM, if you ever heard guest OS or instance or anything like that, it's all good. It's all just a, a virtualized machine that runs there. Uh, storage down on the bottom, you know, that's, every cloud's gonna be a little different. If you're talking about putting together like Project Haystacks, which is what Facebook, Instagram uses to store all your pictures, the storage requirements of that cloud are gonna be massively different than maybe the data center I have back in my office. Um, detailed instruction, or detailed words on this slide. Uh, glossary is available. If you just Google OpenStack glossary, I know probably a lot of new words are gonna get thrown at you in this talk. Uh, might help you keep up there. Uh, as far as the controller node, what basic services go on here? Uh, Horizon, I already showed you that, and we'll get back in there and look at it a little bit more. Horizon is uh, the front end uh, that, that would get installed there. Uh, Keystone as well, Keystone is identity. That handles user credentials, uh, permissions, roles. Uh, Glance is image. So VMs need an image in order to be able to boot. Uh, otherwise, you're just trying to switch on. Uh, I put some hardware together and I'm trying to turn it on. Not gonna work real well. Glance will provide an image so the VM is bootable. Uh, Nova, um, again, heart and soul. I'll, I'll teach you about what Nova does in a little bit. Uh, optional services. I don't know that Cinder is really optional. I probably should bump it up to basic services, but Cinder makes block storage available. Block storage are volumes. Uh, think of it like you need to attach a, a hard drive in your, you, in your uh, laptop, right, is an example of a volume there. Um, if you wanted to create additional storage volumes or something, Cinder would reach out and provision a volume off of one of these storage nodes and then probably use iSCSI to connect it to a VM running on compute. Uh, Swift Proxy, if you're going to run object storage, Swift Proxy might be there. Trove is database as a service. Um, maybe you have it, maybe you don't. Heat, um, heat's a big deal in that we can write scripts that automate the creation of virtual infrastructure. So IBM has a commercial right now, the cloud expands on demand, the cloud expands on demand. And you watch it, and if you don't know what cloud is, you go, okay, I kind of get it, but what are they talking about? What they're talking about is in an OpenStack environment. 
maybe we have salometer up on the controller node and salometer is actually measuring, remember it, it's telemetry, it's measuring um, resource consumption of a particular VM running in our cloud, maybe an asterisk box. And Salometer reports for the last five minutes, memory consumption's been at, say, 70%. So we have another telemetry module called E, it's a, a Gaelic word, uh, E, which is Gaelic for heat. Heat, or fire, excuse me, fire creates heat Heat makes the cloud rise. So E is a set of trigger conditions. It would look at Salometer statistics and say, oh, we have a VM that's burning up red hot. I will throw a trigger to call heat, and heat will run a template that maybe spins up another VM that has an asterisk instance in it. We can start load balancing against the two, and suddenly resource consumption drops within our environment. Um, other supporting services you're going to find there, uh, out of the box, MariaDB and RabbitMQ uh, are both going to wind up on the controller node as well. Uh, Neutron node, um, or the networking node, Neutron goes here. Neutron is the service that sets up all of our virtual networking infrastructure. Um, if I have time at the end, I'll come back and talk about it some more, but for right now, just know, okay, networking node, Neutron. Uh, compute nodes, what goes on here, like I said, let's install Ubuntu first, and then let's install one of our hypervisors here. KVM or QEMU are gonna be the most popular. And although there are a lot of hypervisors to reach for, we probably don't wanna mix and match hypervisors within our environment. I'll show you why in just a little bit. Uh, we are also going to have little extension offices um, sitting down here so that Nova and Neutron can actually send commands down to their little extension offices sitting on the compute node, which will then in turn manipulate the hypervisor into doing things. So I don't want anybody thinking that OpenStack really builds anything. OpenStack's more of an architect. It keeps track of where all of your compute nodes is. It keeps track of all of your hypervisors. It sends orders to the hypervisors to do things. But the hypervisors at the end of the day are what create the virtual machines or virtual infrastructure for us to use. So at this point, we should realize what's the cloud? Well, the cloud's compute. It's as many compute nodes, hardware resources as we have running hypervisors. How do we grow our cloud? Just add more compute. Tell Nova back on the controller node, more compute nodes showed up. Uh, where do VMs run? Out on compute. And just why I'm thinking about it, these compute nodes, what goes in there? Uh, first of all, all this hardware, controller node, network node, compute node, potentially could be the exact same hardware. The question is simply what we're ins installing on it differentiates, it differentiates it from a controller node to a network node or compute node. Those compute nodes are probably running um, dual socket or quad socket motherboards. Um, let's say we have a dual socket motherboard um, running a Xenon process with like 18 cores. So we potentially, each one of these compute nodes has 36 cores inside of it. Well, default oversubscription rate in OpenStack is 16 times, which means if we wanted to create a VM down here on a compute node, right, that compute node will support 16 times 36 VMs, right? That's a, that's a lot of potential um, virtual machines to be running on a single machine. Um, but you start to get an idea of how many, what we used to call servers, one-for-one -one relationships, how many virtual servers that we might now be able to support in a single data center. Really, at the end of the day, what OpenStack allows us to do is fully saturate the hardware that we have. There's no resources that are just sitting around creating heat anymore. They're actually being utilized. Uh, so what is a hypervisor? Uh, well, there's three parts of this slide I need us to understand. Uh, the top part is a virtual machine. The bottom part is the hypervisor. And the third part will be 
Jordi LaForge, he wears a visor, so he's my hypervisor helper here, uh, straddling the two. So first of all, that little asterisk um, that I, I kicked off the presentation with and it did some work for us, understand that's just an application running on top of an operating system, right? So this is Ubuntu 1404, 1606, whatever, whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be Linux. You're welcome to run a Windows server up there, whatever floats your boat. Universal truth that we have device drivers controlling some set of hardware down here. An open stack we call, and this is a virtualized set of hardware, it's not the real hardware. An open stack we call that a flavor. So you create a flavor in OpenStack and say something like, oh, one virtual CPU, one NIC, a, you know, two gigs of RAM or something like that. That's a flavor. It defines the hardware set that we're applying to a VM. Uh, down on the bottom, this would probably be KVM down here. And KVM is in control of the real hardware. So what we have to understand is that if this guy is KVM, Jordi LaForge Visor Hypervisor, he has part of his body in the virtual machine and part of his body down in the hypervisor. Now what Jordi LaForge can do is actually separate himself. We can take his body, we can take this whole top part off of the hypervisor and we could move it. There's lots of good reasons to be able to want to be able to do that. Suppose that VM's running right there on that compute node. We find out, hey, we have to upgrade this compute node, install more hardware or something like that. You can actually live migrate, that is in real time without stopping the VM. Say, hey, I want you to move to a different compute node because I'm evacuating this compute node. I want to be able to do something. I want to be able to take it offline and do something with it. Well, consider if you want to be able to move a VM from one compute node to another compute node, Jordy's body has to reconnect with his legs. I mean, it doesn't have to be on the same, it doesn't have to be on the exact same hypervisor, but it has to be on the same flavor of hypervisor. So if this is KVM, this has to be KVM down here if I'm going to migrate that VM. That is to say, I can't migrate a VM that's running on a KVM hypervisor to say like a Zen hypervisor or say a Hyper-V hypervisor. And that's why I said earlier, in an environment, you're probably gonna pick just one hypervisor and say, this is what we're gonna use across our cloud, KVM, QEMU. Um, so that's why we really don't want to mix and match hypervisors within our environment. Um, and I already talked about how, you know, what's really doing the work here? Well, it's the hypervisor. The hypervisor's just taking commands from controller node or network node, whichever it may be. Uh, storage nodes, I'm not going to talk about storage a whole lot, but just know Cinder is probably a required service. It, it does block, so if we want volumes to attach to our VMs, we need that. Basically, um, if you don't have that, you're gonna get a lot of a, a, a ephemeral storage, which means as soon as you reset that VM, it's gonna go back to the way the image looked, right? Um, so we want this. Swift does object storage. Um, we talk a lot on that. Uh, the object storage is, if you've ever used like Dropbox, or you've ever used Google Drive, or you've ever used um, Microsoft OneDrive on Windows 10, that's all object storage. It's just an idea, at least for the purposes of this talk. It's the idea that we'll use an HTTP access to actually get to the storage itself. Um, object is well suited for just about everything except for highly structured data. So we could say oh, everything but relational databases will work great in object storage. Um, Ceph is not officially part of OpenStack, but I like to talk about it a little bit. It will do object or block. It doesn't do any table-driven placement. It uses all uh, algorithm-driven uh, logic to decide where objects might end up in your storage nodes. But um, they're at least something to, to Google and read more about if you're interested in storage. Uh, proof of concepts, if you're interested in maybe trying OpenStack out and deploying it, 
Uh, the OpenStack Foundation recommends you start off for a proof of concept cloud with three x86 servers, that would be your controller node, network node, and one compute. They want 10 gig NICs, primary and secondary interfaces, and a one gig NIC just for management in there. Uh, two 48 port 10 gig switches with 40 gig uplinks. That particular build you can keep adding x86 hypervisors to. You can create and roll up to 47 um, compute nodes in there. That's, I mean, in my mind, for a lot of applications, that's, that's way more than just proof of concept. That starts becoming just straight up overkill for a lot of environments. Um, but if you want a real production cloud, uh, they say, okay, start with five x86 servers, uh, really take home as we add two leaf switches, so some switches above uh, that guy. I'm sorry, spine switches, excuse me. Um, that particular model, dropping in these two spine switches, they say, well, that'll build out a cloud that'll have 1,535 um, hypervisors or compute nodes in it. And remember, you're talking about how many CPUs you have, right? Maybe two, two physical CPUs. Uh, how many cores you have, maybe 36. And then your oversubscription rate, 16. And then that times 1,535 is potentially how many single uh, virtual CPU um, VMs you're going to be able to build. That's a very, very large number, right? Uh, down here, uh, if you want to look at what it takes to install this stuff, again, just Google OpenStack Mataka install guide and it'll pop right up for you. Uh, so back to asterisk here. Um, if we look at asterisk running in a virtual environment, is it gonna look from a customer perspective is this thing going to look any different than one running on bare metal? And the answer is no, it won't. Uh, I took this trace last night uh, from the server that I just showed a moment ago. Uh, when I started off the, the talk and made the call, I, I took a trace from that box. And you can see here it's, it's typical SIP. Um, there's nothing really to be that worried about here. There's RTP cutting through, uh, call being answered, I flipped by, and somewhere down the end, right? We see the call terminate as normal, right? There's your buys and your 200s. Uh, if you want to check that out more, even though it's just a normal asterisk trace of asterisk hair pinning a call, um, you can check out my website, um, rzfeaser.com. Uh, the latest blog posting I have has that available for download. Uh, so let's talk, yeah, right on time. Let's talk about how all these services would work together. Let's tell a story about somebody logging into, somebody logging into Horizon here and they want to build a virtual machine. Now understand, a serious admin, they're not gonna waste any time in Horizon, that's a joke. You can do anything I'm gonna to describe to you in Horizon is, is preferably done at, down at the command line, but that tends to alienate customers. Uh, so let's say we log into Horizon, our user interface. What's the story we can tell here? Well, initially, Horizon's gonna reach out to Keystone and say, hey, Keystone, I got Bob Bobberton here, is he allowed in this thing? And Keystone will say back, yeah, not only is he allowed in it, here's a token that represents his permissions. You don't have to use that password and say, and it's a, a PKI token, it's, it's, I'll talk more about that in a second. But here's a token that represents this user. Um, furthermore, here is his roles, and here are, so what he can and can't do. And here is his uh, service catalog. Hey, the service catalog lights up for Horizon all of the API endpoints that these services are listening to. Okay? So Horizon now is just sitting there. This user makes a click, says, I want to build a VM. I want these particular benchmarks on it. Go. At this point, you know, remember, 
Our cloud has potentially many hundreds of compute nodes in it. We don't have to worry about where this VM gets built. That's the point of Nova. So an order to boot a VM is sent to Nova. Nova checks a scheduling algorithm and says, OK, based on what you're trying to build, what hypervisors could support this, which one is maybe least filled, and I choose you. And it'll send the order to Nova Compute. Nova Compute is the little instance of Nova that runs out on a compute node down here. It's what talks locally to the hypervisor. So Nova Compute says, OK, I know I have to pass on to the hypervisor that some particular VM needs to be built. But in order for that to be built, maybe we have to retrieve the image from Glance. Glance would be, uh, maybe it would store the um, Ubuntu image or the Windows image or whatever it might be we're trying to boot. Where that image is stored, it could be locally, it could be as an object that maybe Swift um, is managing out here on our storage node. Uh, we also probably want a volume connected to this VM. We want to be able to save changes. Uh, so Cinder over here will carve up a volume for us and then pass the information over to Nova Compute. Here's the particular socket you can use to throw an iSCSI connection from your little VM here over to this compute or storage node over here. It might be at this time, Neutron steps in and says, hey, I see you got uh, your VM coming up. Let me step in and apply all the virtual networking aspects of this. Um, so remember, all of this is really just passed, these instructions are passed on to the hypervisor. I sort of think of Nova as an architect, maybe Nova Compute as like an on-site foreman, and the hypervisor's like the work crew that's really gonna do the heavy work here, right, of actually building the VM there. So he's just sending, here's what I want done, Nova Compute sort of pulling all the resources together and then telling the hypervisor, here's what you're gonna do, make it happen. Uh, other guys I haven't talked about here yet. I guess Solometer, right? I already told this story, but Solometer could be monitoring uh, usage of this VM. And if it saw that this VM was sort of burning up, eh, could throw a trigger and say, well, we're seeing resources heavily consumed by this VM. I'm going to throw a trigger to Heat, where Heat could have a script written that just automates the creation of another VM, maybe of a load balancing proxy or something like that. Um, and suddenly, a second VM comes up with maybe calls sort of um, balanced, uh, load balance between the two. Uh, what I thought I'd do real quick is log into Horizon, and we'll just launch a VM here. So this is the Horizon front end. Um, there's, I mean, days to talk about uh, this. This just even Horizon um, would take days to explain everything. But uh, real quick, I, I, let's just launch an instance and see what that takes. Um, initially, I need to give it some sort of name. So we'll call it Astrakhan, uh, a source. So it's asking for an image. Um, OpenStack made a image called Ceros, which is another play on name. Ceros clouds are the super little wispy ones up in the air nobody really cares about. Um, this is a proof of concept image. Um, it's as small as we can possibly make an operating system. It's, it's 13 megs in size, right? Uh, flavor, that's the associated hardware we want to boot it with. Um, I have one called M1 Tiny here. It's essentially the benchmarks you'd find on a Raspberry Pi. So a one gig disk, um, half a gig of RAM, one virtual CPU. Uh, network, and apply what network I want to put it on. And that's probably enough for right now. I can hit launch instance.
And you can see my VM is building right there. If I click on it, I can show you one way that you could interact with this guy. Uh, come into console, and actually right here on, in uh, Horizon is uh, VNC, uh, which is allowing me uh, just a cut through straight to that VM. So if I wanted to, I could actually log into that virtual machine I just built. All right, and there you go. That's one way you could potentially interact with a virtual machine that you create. Another way is just typical SSH access would be fine as well. Uh, so, GVM. I already said that uh, preferably, you know, power admins aren't going to really like using the Horizon front end. Um, there's a lot more functionality down at the CLI. Uh, there's all sorts of there are Python clients that get installed there. Essentially, you write your little command, it creates the HTTP message for you and fires it off to the associated service. So, um, just some closing thoughts here. Uh, OpenStack's just coming out of its growing pains. Um, I would argue the same way, like four or five years ago, was a fantastic time to get involved in like LTE and IMS. Uh, if you're interested in cloud, now is an awesome time to get involved in OpenStack. It's really the, the polish is, is going on it right now. Um, market's going to continue to see lots and lots of vendor solutions displaced by OpenStack and OpenStack solution. Uh, if you wanted to get started with OpenStack, like, hey, this thing seems kind of cool, it may be something, some stuff I should know about here, uh, I would recommend checking out a thing called DevStack, a developer's stack. You can install this on a single virtual machine. So, ironically, you could, like, start VMware, VMware Player, or virtual box or something, create a VM with a limited set of hard or, or benchmarks, I mean, we're talking like four gigs of RAM or a uh, 20 gig disk. Um, and that would be fine. You could run this dev stack right inside of a, a like a, I said, VMware player virtual box or something. Um, of course, it's not for production, but it's a super awesome place to get started. Um, all the little bells and whistles seem to be there and you can click around and at least learn about it. Uh, install instructions for dev stack. Again, that blog I kept shouting out about. Um, feel free to click over there, rzfeaser.com, and I actually included in that blog exactly what you have to type in the Ubuntu command line in order to install DevStack. So, uh, who's got some questions for me? Because that's what I got. Go ahead, back in the corner. Do a uh, hold, Tori, while I bring over a mic. Uh, hi, uh, going back to the diagram, it looked like the compute node and the network node look like pretty uh, dangerous single points of failure. Oh, I assume yeah. if the network node goes down, the entire cluster goes down. I was just wondering what kind of redundancy mechanisms. Yeah, that's a super uh, cool question. Um, yeah. So uh, the, the network node, understand if you were to lose controller or network, um, your cloud becomes immutable. It'll keep running. But that's all it'll do is keep running, right? And that's not good. People are going to want to switch on VMs and switch off VMs, right? Uh, so to, to prevent that sort of thing, what OpenStack recommends is you run um, uh, three, I think we're running one primary, two secondaries um, in order to prevent that sort of failure from occurring. Um, but understand, if you, if you lost that stuff, things would keep working. It's just you're not making any changes there. Other questions? There we go. Uh, any other questions, like you said? OK. If not, uh, thank you very much for the information on OpenStack. Yeah, thank uh, you. And if anyone would like to provide feedback and all of that, uh, you can use the sketch thing, as previously mentioned. You can find his talk on there. Uh, and uh, we'll be starting the next presentation in about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, guys.